Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be back speaking to you all again after a long four and a half months. Um, first up, housekeeping. I'm not here in any official capacity today. Just me chatting with my friends about justice matters. OK, just so that we've got that clear before we start. So there's a few things that have come around in the last couple of weeks that I wanted to talk to you about and, and see what people think. So let's start with this week's news. The FBI profiler who said the profile didn't match Luke Mitchell. And we told them that at the time. And they ignored us. Hmm. Now, the argument would be, I've been asked by quite a few people, you know, would this, would this uh, be able to be used? Hi, Sharon. <laughs> Hope you're well. Um, would this be able to be used as new evidence and all of that sort of thing? And the answer is no. Um, they didn't rely on it at the time. It wasn't used in the trial. It wasn't used at all. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. Cost. They flew two senior officers to the States on a lovely little jolly for them to get this profile that they then ignored. I don't know what that would have cost, but you've got the cost of their flights, the cost of their accommodation, the cost of everything while they were over there, plus their salaries for something that was tossed in the bin. And that got me thinking about another aspect of this case, and it happens in, in lots of cases, but let, let's just stick with the Luke Mitchell case for the minute. The building of the replica wall. So they took the jury from the courtroom to the actual wall, the real wall, to let them see where everything was supposed to have happened and, and what the claims were for what had happened and distances and all of that, okay? And then they built a replica of the wall, not in the court itself, but in another building and took all the jury over to this other building to look at this duplicate wall, this replica wall. And the question is why? If they'd already been to the real wall, why did they need a replica wall? And the answer to that is absolutely shocking. It was pure theater. The cost of the other building, the replica wall, everything that was involved in that was for nothing other than pure theater. So let me explain. They get this replica wall built and they put the, the members of the family members of the search party at the V point. And the prosecutor walks 13.6 meters or 16.3 meters away from them turns and, and makes like he's shining a torch and walks back towards them and says, is that what happened? And they say, no. And they're telling the truth. So far, so good. The problem here is nobody at any point suggested that was what had happened. So this pure theater of, you stand there and I'll walk away from you and then I'll walk back towards you and I'll ask you, is that what happened? And they say no, was to make it look like Luke Mitchell was lying. Not one person ever claimed that was what happened. Why is all of this important? Well, money. Let's look at legal aid and the fact that we know that legal aid for defence has been cut to the bone over and over and over and over and over again. So that, for example, um, the cell site analysis in Luke's case, the, the expert was deemed to be too expensive. I'm going to guess, tiny one, that it wasn't as expensive as flying two senior officers to the States to obtain a profile that they weren't going to use or hiring another building entirely and building a replica wall. I'm guessing it wasn't as expensive as that, but it was refused on the grounds that it was too expensive and that they'd have to go find another expert. The same argument is used for policing 
and for police investigations um, cutting corners and not being able to be as thorough as they should be. It's money. They don't get enough money. There's not enough funding. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe if they didn't spend so much money on rubbish for the prosecution, there would be more money for police investigations. There would be more money for defences. So that was one of the things that this, this FBI story kind of threw up for me this week was uh, people were asking what was the cost of the prosecution versus the defense and the answer to that is i don't know i don't know what the figures were but when you look at things like that they, they were given the money to go to the states they were given the money to build a replica wall but the defense were refused this this paltry amount in comparison for something that actually could have provided a robust defense against the prosecution case. How unfair is a system that allows that? So, yeah, um, I'm not me, 354, waste of taxpayers' money too. Yeah, because we paid for that. <laughs> we paid for the trip to the States. We paid for the replica wall. We paid for the entire trial as well. And all the police officers who were involved in the investigation that we now know that we now know was disastrous. So that then got me thinking about the legal aid system in general. And it, it has occurred to me before, but it brought it back into kind of sharp relief this week. We don't know how our justice system works in this country. We've been taught through the whole legal aid system if you get arrested, if you, you know, if, if for some reason you land up on that side of the law, don't worry about it, it's all taken care of. The lawyers will be wheeled in and they'll deal with everything. We're never and have never been encouraged to ask what's actually going on, what's being done, why it's being done and how it might affect us. And my last 18 years in this work I've seen this come up again and again and again. We trusted that they were doing what needed to be done. Uh-huh. But did you know what needed to be done? Well, no. Why would I? Why would I have to know? That's what they're there for. This, this particular uh, live is all about education. Yeah, it's all about saying we we need to know as individuals and, and as a society, we need to see what's done, why it's done, how it's done and what the outcomes are. And we need to understand that because for as long as we are blindly relying on the system to do the right thing, innocent people are being put in jail day after day and discovering once they're there, it's virtually impossible to undo the damage that's been done. Now, I'm talking about me here as well. Prior, prior to this work, I had no reason to question whether it was being done properly. I had no reason to question how the system moves from one place to the next to the next. To the next. I, I, it never occurred to me. And I think one of the, one of the biggest difficulties for people that has never happened to is they, they just can't imagine why it's relevant to them? Why should it be relevant to them? Because they've never been affected by it. They're never going to be affected by it. If this year has shown us anything, it's this huge wake up call of it could happen to anybody, including you or a member of your family. So we need to know, we need to start learning and we need to find places that will teach us what we need to know. So that takes me on to something else that was sent to me this week. And even, even I, after 18 years of turning the system on its head and going, no, 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 kind of did a double take on this one. So let me tell you what it was about. Lord Hope, 
was speaking um, in the Lords about the, the new police crime sentencing and courts bill in England and Wales, uh, which is intended to update the criminal justice system in England and Wales. And he was talking in particular about um, an amendment that, now let me, let me quote it, would pave the way for a duty of candor in police dealings with the victims of crime and relatives of victims of crime. A duty of candor. Okay, let's see what he had to say about it and then we'll talk about what it means. So here's what Lord Hope said. I look at the situation from an unusual perspective and with an unusual experience of sitting as a senior judge in Scotland in a criminal appeal. It was a case of murder and I was not able, because I was sitting in court where all the evidence was already out, to develop what was at the back of my mind, which was that the police identified the wrong individual who was then accused and convicted. I will not go into the facts of the case for obvious reasons, but it struck me that the court at that late stage was powerless to deal with what I thought had not been a frank and fair police investigation. I make that point simply because stages are reached where the situation is beyond recall. But I was deeply disturbed by what had happened in that case and could not do anything about it. Now, what does that mean? We believe that judges have the power to put things right when they've gone wrong. That's why we believe in the appeal system. That's why we believe in judicial review, all of that. We believe that judges have the power somewhere along the line to put it right. What Lord Hope is telling us here is they don't. They don't. What he's saying absolutely clearly is if the police investigation, no matter how it's been gone about, no matter how it's, the case has been constructed, if the police investigation is accepted for trial and the trial goes ahead on the basis of that, there's nothing the courts can do about it if a conviction is obtained. Now think about that. What, how, how can that be a thing in the 21st century? They, they accept the, the police case because they have to, because the police are supposed to be honest and, and doing their job properly. Now, I've said for years, and I've had many, many arguments over the years about this, that people can be convicted, that the process can go all the way through, beginning to end, without breaking any protocol and still convict the wrong person. And there, is how it happens. There is how it happens. He said, after all the evidence is out. Yeah, so even if all the evidence is pointing to the wrong person, but it's in front of the jury, game over. So your appeal on the basis that, that the police made a howling what's it of it is a waste of time. Now, who can buy that? Who, who can accept that that's the way our justice system works. And yet, this is a senior judge. They aptly named Lord Hope, telling us once it gets to that stage, nothing anybody can do about it. Having, having seen this article, I thought one of the things that people will be saying as well, if they're, if they're having these discussions about amendments to the criminal justice system in England and Wales, Potentially, Scotland will follow suit. And it's a nice idea, but how many of you have heard of the report that's entitled Policing, Complaints Handling, Investigations and Misconduct Issues, Independent Review? It was published on the 11th of November, 2020. So almost a year ago to the date. Of those of you who have heard it, 
heard of it, how many of you have actually read it? This was the first, and I'm reading this directly from the, the front of the report, the first independent review of complaint handling, misconduct and investigations since the creation of the new policing structures in 2013. So Police Scotland, when they amalgamated all the police forces. This was the first independent review since 2013. And this is November 2020. What did it have to say? And, and in what ways did it show the effects or the efficiency of Police Scotland? Rather than go through the whole thing, which would just be tedious, I thought what I'd do is pick out some of the recommendations and we'll work backwards and figure out why, why did we need these recommendations? Um, I, sorry, somebody asking where we can find the report. I'll, I'll put a link after the live. Sorry, I should have had it in before now. Um, I was not as organized as I might have been. This is the first time I've done this in four and a half months. So let's look at the recommendations and work backwards to see why we think we might need these recommendations for our existing police force who've been doing this since 2013 without apparently any guidance. Okay, recommend, recommendation number three. I'll read it first and then we can think about it. Other than for pressing operational reasons, police officers involved in a death in custody or serious incident, whether as principal officers or witnesses to the incident, should not confer or speak to each other following that incident and prior to producing their initial accounts and statements on any matter concerning their individual recollections of the incident, even about seemingly minor details. As with civilian witnesses, <laughs> all statements should be the honestly held recollection of the individual officer. Hmm. They shouldn't confer, they shouldn't speak to each other, and their account should be the honestly held recollection of the individual officer. What do we think came up in the review that required that recommendation? It's not rocket science. <laughs> it's so not rocket science. So principal officers or witnesses to police who were witnesses to incidents were conferring and speaking to each other prior to producing their initial accounts. Hmm. That might um, come down along the lines of collusion, maybe. And as with civilian witnesses, all statements should be the honestly held recollection. Hmm. Does that suggest that some of their statements were not the honestly held recollections? Well, since we're talking about since 2013, how many? And in what cases? And what were the consequences? And we also have to point out that 10 years before Police Scotland be became Police Scotland, civilian witnesses were being allowed to speak to each other. And there was no problem with their honestly held recollections changing as a result of those conversations with each other. But here we are at last, good news, 2020. We have a recommendation to keep them on track. Excellent. Okay, recommendation number 10. The Scottish Government should propose amendment of the Police and Fire Reform Act 2012 to the following effect. There should be an explicit duty of candour on the police to cooperate fully with all investigations into allegations against its officers. They have to, they have to include this in the act to make it happen. An explicit duty of candor to cooperate fully with all investigations into allegations against its officers. Okay. Let's turn it around again. Why do we need that guidance written into an act? The suggestion is 
that the police don't cooperate fully with investigations into allegations against its own officers. And again, we've only we've only got this in 2020, and we've had police Scotland since 2013. So how many officers who should have been investigated and weren't because of this lack of candor amongst other police officers between 2013 and 2020? And how much difference do we really think this will make? Recommendation number 12. Um, so this is about uh, conduct regulations. Constables have a duty to assist during investigations, inquiries and formal proceedings, participating openly, promptly and professionally in lines in line with the expectations of a police officer when identified as a witness. So this is yet another suggestion that police officers are not assisting openly, promptly and professionally. Now, this is pretty damning stuff. Bearing in mind what I just said about Lord Hope saying that at the police investigation stage, once that's accepted and taken to trial, if it's accepted by the jury, it's game over for the accused if they're found guilty. And now we find we have lack of candour. We have police officers colluding and speaking to each other before they give their statements. We have uh, constables not participating openly, promptly and professionally. How many people do we think have had cases built against them on the basis of these feelings that until 2020, there was no official acknowledgement of whatsoever. So these are things, yeah, we really have to think about because this is being done in our name. These officers are acting on our behalf. So I suppose one of the one of the big questions is why did it take until 2020 to have a look at what they were doing and to see if there was any problems with it? Why why were since since they pulled them all together into one police force, why were they not being monitored from day one to see what the effects were and to see if there were any problems with the new organization? Didn't didn't occur to anybody that it might be worth keeping an eye on. There are another two recommendations that I, I just want to touch on because um, I, I just think they're really interesting. Recommendation number 18. In the light of the very worrying evidence that I have received, I consider that issues related to discrimination and their impact on public confidence in Police Scotland should be the subject of a broader fundamental review of equality matters by an independent organisation. Hmm. Very worrying evidence that presumably has been floating around the system for seven years going nowhere. Now, this, this report makes reference to um, public perceptions of police, policing police. And everything just going around in circles and nothing getting done. And I think <laughs> Shona Miller couldn't investigate something. I'm really, yeah. Um, I, I think that public perception of police policing police has been an issue for, for really for quite a long time. And like everything else, it seems in our justice system, it's ignored, it's swept under the carpet. We ordinary people are just minions. There's no, there's no attention given to our perceptions until until it becomes an issue that's that's too much to sweep under the carpet and then action has to be taken. So that's that's the bottom line. For as long as they get away with it, they'll keep getting away with it until it starts to crumble. And then it then they think, oh we better we better do something to appease, to appease us, the ordinary people, to make it look like something's being done. So this report in 2020 was to make it look like something was being done. But all it did was make recommendations. How do we ensure 
that those recommendations are followed through? How do we make sure they're held to account? And who do we put in charge of holding them accountable? Uh, Luke and Justice, I'll come back to your question in a minute. Just let me do the last the last recommendation here and then I'll come back to this question. Um, last one, recommendation 47. Where the terms of a complaint made allege a breach of Article 3 by a police officer, that's the right not to be tortured or treated in any humane or degrading way, and therefore that a crime may have been committed, the Crown Office and Pro Procurator Fiscal Service should instruct the PIRC to carry out an independent investigation rather than directing Police Scotland to investigate it. Aha! Uh -huh. So, now we have a fairly open admission that human rights abuses by police officers have been in that same process of going round and round in circles because the police were investigating the police and coming back to the conclusion that they did nothing wrong. The same applies to Article 5, the right to liberty and security of a person, of person rather, um, depending on the circumstances. So it could be argued that those Section 14 interviews up to 2011 all breached an individual's right to liberty and security of person because these people were detained without legal advice or representation. Well, they were just spirited away and subjected to massive interrogations that were supposedly legal in Scotland, but they had this right to liberty and security of person. So, so how, how do we reconcile the two? And how, now that we've got to 2020, and they're saying, oh, well, maybe, maybe we shouldn't have police investigating these. Maybe, maybe we need to have the independent commission investigating these. Now, on top of all the how many wrongful convictions might there have been, we have how many human rights breaches have there been? And personally, I find that quite terrifying. Because, because these recommendations are outright admissions that these things have been allowed in policing in Scotland all this time. And then we have Lord Hope saying, if these things have created a case that has ended up in a conviction, and how could it not? It is designed to end up in a conviction. There's nothing the appeal court can do about it. We now, we do now have the PIRC, the independent um, committee to look at policing. How how reliable that will be, how much power it will have, given that until now it didn't even have the power to look at Article 3 and Artic Article 5 breaches because they were handed back to the police to investigate. Again, it would seem we have a long, long way to go before we can rely on that organisation to hold the police accountable as well. Now, the story, the, sorry, the question, Luke and Justice, can Luke not make a complaint to Police Scotland as it's new, not loathing in borders now. Well, he could, he could, but um, in terms of legal process, would it be, would it be the most effective route for them to take right now? And I am not speaking in an official capacity, <laughs> I have to keep saying this, I'm just here as me today, in my opinion, as me, not a representative or um, working on the case or anything like that, he could make a complaint, but it would not be the most effective route for him to take in terms of overturning his conviction at the minute. That may change. Um, the Going back to the uh, FBI report, the, the question about whether that would be new evidence, I think I explained it wasn't it wasn't relied on by the prosecution, so so it wouldn't be new evidence in its own right. There are there are ways it could be introduced as new evidence, but those are pretty technical and relying on um, other information that we would need 
sorry, that, that Luke's team would need to get to take that forward. Which actually brings me back to um, another aspect of Luke's case and others like him. And that is trying to get uh, information released. So samples for new testing or um, copies of particular reports or anything like that, trying to get them released in order for the defence or the appeal team, because there is no defence after after somebody's been convicted, they don't have a defence, they have an appeal team. Um, getting that information released in order to have these, these new investigations done. The first, the first hurdle that is always thrown in the way is it's called the fishing expedition. So you just want all the information to, to trawl through it and see if you can find something to get the case back to the Court of Appeal. Well, OK, even if that were the case, what's wrong with that? We're not asking the state to pay for it. We're not asking the taxpayer to pay for it. In most cases, people are saying, give us the stuff. And we've got experts willing to do it for free. We've got people like me willing to do it for free. It's not costing you anything other than the release of the stuff. Let's look at the, the flip side of that. So as you know, in Luke's case, and in many others like him, three police raids on the family home. And they took everything, regardless of whether they thought it was connected to the alleged case that they were investigating or not. They took everything. They took a plastic garden ornament, for example. So they've taken everything in the first raid. Every single item then has to be catalogued, labelled, bagged, and kept somewhere. Six weeks later, they do the same again. What did they think they were going to find six weeks later after they'd taken virtually everything in the first raid? But nope, they came back and they took all new stuff this time. Same process has to be catalogued, labelled, bagged, stored. How much money do you think was wasted on those processes three times over? And the argument that a fishing, a fishing expedition is um, a waste of taxpayers' money. No, all they have to do is go and get the stuff they catalogued themselves and hand it over. That's it. That is the end of their costs. So it's not about money in that instance, not at all. It's about making sure people don't get to the stuff that's been hidden in that mountain of rubbish, essentially, that, that was collected. So I was going to say something else about that. Oh yeah, getting getting um, samples released and and things like that. So again, we let's say by some miracle in a case, we get. Um, David, I'll come back to your question in a minute. We get articles released, or let me let me go at that a different way. In one case that I have had some involvement with, not in Scotland, the courts ordered the police to release samples that they had. And the police just ignored the court. And I don't mean for a week or two or for a month or two, but for years. Now, once again, we've just talked about how the courts can't do anything about a police case that's gone all the way to conviction. Now we have courts saying, give them the stuff. And they go, no. And then just don't do it. What then? What then? But let's see. Let's go one step further and say, by some miracle, the stuff gets released. And you get your experts to look at it and they come up with some, some new 
evidence or some new um, perspective on that evidence. And immediately you run into another obstacle and the commission will say something like, well, it's not really new because because that could have been known at the time of the trial. Now, there's a case that I'm, I'm, I have been involved in. That's as much as I can say about it. But essentially, a witness lied. And it's bound to happen all the time. But then the witness came clean and said, sorry, I didn't tell the truth. How does the commission deal with that? They said, well, the information that this witness came forward with to say, I lied, that was not the truth, could have been known at the time of the trial. Well, yeah, it could have been known if the witness hadn't lied. But they're taken to be telling the truth because they're on oath. So you see how this just goes round and round and round and round. We're, we're endlessly meeting this this case of it, it's there's no there's no will to get to the truth once once a result has been had everything is piled up against it to avoid having to say mm, that result wasn't actually a result that that was manipulated into existence so yes i took time out and maybe hearing some of this you'll understand why it feels <coughs> sorry <coughs> it feels sometimes like there is no way past it like they have it so tightly tied up that no matter what we do we can't get through yeah val constantly up against a brick wall but i used to renovate properties and that quite often involved um demolishing walls and it's funny you can you can bash away at the wall randomly and and get really really tired and the wall stands there defiantly going i'm not coming down you can if you're smart chip out a single brick near the bottom and with that single brick out if you bash the ones either side of it the wall will come down and that's where we have to be those of us who want to fight the disgrace that is our justice system make it more accountable make it answerable for its own failings we need to concentrate on the single bricks and not the whole wall because trying to beat down the whole wall you end up exhausted and the wall is still standing so we pick our bricks and we beat away on them and i hope that explains in some ways why um the group has quite strict rules about what can and can't be said and how it can be done and how it can be gone about it's to keep us on individual bricks rather than the entire wall and it is it is an important uh, an important point um Oh, hang on. I've just lost the the question. I was going to. David, do the prosecution not have to declare an itemized bill of how they spent our money? No. No, they do have to. They do have to. Uh, not not the prosecution. No, um, the defence does have to keep a, a running total because they have to justify the legal aid that they got. The prosecution. I've never seen an itemized bill. For the prosecution in any case um like i said how much how much does it cost to to fly two officers and build a replica wall i might try a freedom of information request actually just to see if we can get that information but if we have to do individual freedom of information requests for each cost each funding you can see how that would quickly get out of hand as well but yeah, we should be. There should be somewhere we can go and say, how much did this entire trial cost for the prosecution? In every case, because, like we said, that's our money. That's our money they spent.
Derek, had they done the same with other persons of interest, Jodie would have had a rightful justice. Yes. Yes. And that comes back to this, these police recommendations. I think it's clear. I think it's clear that the, the, the independent review is essentially saying they stitch it up among themselves up until 2020. They have they have stitched it up among themselves to create the cases they want to, keep, to create. Now, we've suspected this for a long time, and a lot of the information we've come across does appear to demonstrate it. But to have an independent review making these recommendations, so they're essentially accepting that. They're essentially saying, yes, that is what they do. And they're very naughty, and they shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, well, that's not good enough. That will never be good enough. Very naughty. No, it's it's beyond wicked to set up innocent people, knowingly set up innocent people and create cases just to get the conviction, regardless of whether the person did it or not. I've said it a million times. It's not justice for the convicted person. It is definitely not justice for the victim and the victim's family. And where does it leave the rest of us? Because if they keep getting away with this, and, and I said this earlier, how many times since 2013? How many times since 2003 in reality? But let's just take it since the beginning of Police Scotland. How many times? How many people? And it's not just this wrongful accusation and conviction side of things. The 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 case of Reese Bonner, where they just apparently didn't even bother to investigate. Just nah, nah, we're, not, we're just not going to look at it. We're not going to try and find out what happened to him. And the disgusting treatment of that lad when his body was found. Those officers should have been, well, they should have been sacked, but they should have faced criminal proceedings. I'm not going to go into details because I don't know if his family might hear this, and I know they put this out there, but it's very, very distressing for them. Those officers should have been, they should have been facing criminal proceedings. That family should not, to this day, be trying to get an investigation into how their son was killed. So there are two sides to this. It's not just that people are wrongly accused and convicted, but also that people who need the truth and, and who there are still murderers walking among us, whether they've convicted the wrong person or just not even bothered to do an investigation, there are still murderers walking among us. And that should worry all of us. That really should worry all of us. Excuse me, people who say, ah, oh, it's nothing to do with me. Yeah, at the minute, at the minute, it's nothing to, you, to do with you. God forbid it ever should become something to do with you. And and none of us can guarantee it won't. That's that's our bottom line. That's what we're dealing with. Um, yes, four and a half months away. I have not been away from this work. Um, I've been away from this version of this work. And I don't mean to be um, anything like that. What I'm trying to say is it's a big, big fight and it needs us, all of us, standing up there and saying, not in my name, not in my name. And ways of doing this, well, the, the petition, as you know, the petition for the independent review at the minute, an independent review is one of the only ways we're ever going to get to the truth in this case. Um, it's, it's a lovely idea to think that one day we might get the, the stuff released that, that we would like to see released and retested and all of that. But it's more than that now. It's not just the overturning of a conviction. It's the examination of the whole raft of processes that allowed that conviction to ever take place in the first place so that they can learn from it. 
so that they can look at it and say, this should never be allowed to happen again. And here is how we can put things in place to make sure it never happens again. Now, if they've got nothing to hide, if the entire system's got nothing to hide, then what reason would anybody have for saying don't have an independent review? The, the people who believe that Luke Mitchell's guilty, what reason would they have not to want an independent review? We've already said if they will allow the stuff to be released, we, the public, will raise the funds to pay for it. We're not asking for taxpayers' money. We'll raise the money. So what's the problem? You, you have to ask, who's afraid of the truth? At the end of the day, who's afraid of the truth? So, sorry, I've lost your comments. Um, yeah, so so people people are sharing the um, the link to the petition again. I'll put the link in both on YouTube and on Facebook. I should have had that all set up before I started. Um, but yeah, taking taking that and the petition to say, look, there's twenty five thousand people in Scotland have questions about a case that's supposed to be resolved beyond reasonable doubt. 25,000 people with questions is not beyond reasonable doubt, is it? And those are their own rules. It has to be beyond reasonable doubt. So again, I, I, I'm not quite sure what the, um, what the issues are with not having an independent review. We've talked about cost. Um, th there is this, <laughs> this ridiculous claim that it's undermining justice. Okay, so not answering questions that really need answered and not releasing information that would give the full picture isn't undermining public confidence, isn't undermining justice. Well, it's not the way I see it. The way I see it is if you want to if you want to encourage um, confidence in policing and confidence in our justice system, then you need to show that it's being done properly. <laughs> you can't just go, nope, nope, we're not, we're not talking about that. It needs to be seen to be done properly. And at least 25,000 people or almost 25,000 people at the minute don't think it was. And those are the ones that have signed the petition. So those of you who have your doubts, who may not yet have signed the petition, please do that. Please add your names and let's get these numbers up because It's our justice system. It's not theirs. It's ours. It works for us. And it's time it was answerable to us. So that's the petition. Now, one other thing, and this is just a little, a little thing I did myself because we've seen a lot since the documentary came out in February, we've seen a lot of people talking about bias and one sidedness and um the a the claims that we're all internet sleuths and keyboard warriors and and amateurs and all of this you know stuff so i got to thinking it would be quite interesting to have a look at how many experts over the years have commented on this case and I've commented in particular about flaws, failings, um, errors, that sort of thing. So I put together an email, an email I did not put together an email. Where did that come from? I put together a video for YouTube, which will probably go out tomorrow with all these experts back to back. So it's not really a narrative. You can you can hear the narrative from the experts' comments all the way through. In this 25-minute video, they identify 53 flaws, errors, and failings. 
53. And that's not us, the Joe Publics here. That's not those of us who are being accused of being amateurs and, you know, a Google search means we know more than the experts and everything. No, no, no. These are the actual experts. So this video runs from 2007 to now, over 25 minutes. So I thought I would, I thought I would throw that in there because, um, well, like I said, one of the things that, that we're often accused of is bias and one-sidedness and uh, amateurism and all of that. So, yep, yeah, the, real, the, real, the real experts, all in one video. Uh, Anna, it's funny when people call us amateur detectives, ignoring the fact that a jury are just members of the public in this case, and in this case, not even given the full facts. And furthermore, ignoring the opinions of professionals. Well, goodness me, imagine that. And you're right, they absolutely do ignore that. So, so on the one hand, they're standing up there giving it, he was found guilty by a jury, yeah, 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 he was. A jury of ordinary people, not experts, yeah? And is there any suggestion whatsoever that that particular jury may have been biased and one-sided. Well, we don't have any proof of that, but we do have the media coverage. So again, something to think about. Uh, Lou, none of it fits or makes sense, never mind beyond reasonable doubt, it's madness. They all know it, and that's why they try to ignore it and won't release info. Yeah. Um, it doesn't make sense, and I, I guess it was never meant to make sense. It, it was cobbled together as a compelling narrative that wasn't ever really supposed to be picked apart in this way. And it worries me that there are many, many people out there who've been through similar and didn't have anybody to pick, pick apart the narrative to show how ludicrous it is and how little sense it makes. So. Again, the more of us talking about these sorts of things, the more of us willing to highlight it and willing to expose it. And yes, I do get that there are risks associated with this. And please, I know there's lots of you that have been out there and you've been doing a fantastic job raising awareness. Please don't put yourselves in danger. You know, there, there are still some people out there who are very, very angry at the amount of uh, public interest, shall we say, in what might have gone wrong here. And I know at least one of the group members was threatened with violence. So please, while it's totally appreciated that, that you're all out there and, and helping to spread awareness, just be careful. Yeah. Um, Julie, I wonder what Judy's thoughts are now after all this time and information now available. Yeah, um, we can't ask. We can't ask. Um, I, I know jurors can speak. Now, I have to be very careful because the media picked up on, on this the last time and said I was encouraging jurors to come forward. No, 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 no. Because we know we can't do that. We can't approach jurors. We're not allowed to. But jurors can speak about aspects of the case after the case is finished and that's all i'm going to say on it so mainstream media please do not misquote me a second time i've made it absolutely clear we cannot approach jurors okay elaine uh great to see you back doing the lives um i don't know i don't know how back i'm going to be elaine uh, i felt after after the FBI thing and after the Lord Hope thing and the the uh, Police Scotland review, I thought this was kind of a good time to to bring us all up to up to speed on the different parts of the justice system that are are now floating to the surface in the public domain and being exposed. Um, I would like to come back fairly regularly when there are updates like this that I can share with you. Um, I don't think I'll be doing weekly again. 
in part because that was designed to be for Luke's case. And once again, for mainstream media, I am not here as a representative of Luke's case. I'm not here in any professional capacity, just me talking about justice matters. Um, so yeah, I, I will come back and I'll do lives probably in this sort of format, uh, maybe some interview formats as well. Um, I haven't quite decided how often or on, on what subject, but I will keep you updated. It's been brilliant to have everybody here. Thank you so much um, for just coming back in and listening and um, interacting through the comments. It, it's always it's always very, very, very encouraging to come in and see you all here, uh, waiting to learn more and waiting to take it and spread the word and, and just being so encouraging. <clears throat> Thank you all so much. It's, it's incredible. Derek, um, I wonder if the jury feel as duped as the other members of the public that have changed their views when presented with the hard facts. That, that must be very, very difficult for any of them who do. Because while we have, while we have, I suppose, the liberty to change your mind and to say, oh, you know, I had that lad guilty for so long, yeah, I didn't. We don't have the responsibility of having put him where he's been for the last 17 years. And I think for, for jurors, that must be one hell of a burden to, to have been on that jury, maybe to have gone with the guilty verdict, to now be going, I don't know that that was the right way to go. It must be awful for them. And I think, again, we, we need to look at the damage that these sorts of cases do to jurors as well. Because they've then got to live with the result of what they did on the basis of what they thought was the truth. To find out years later that it wasn't the truth or it wasn't all of the truth or a lot of it was just made up rubbish. And not to be able to do anything about that, not to be able to go to somebody and say, listen, I want this done again. Because now that I know what I know, I would have voted differently in that verdict. So there's another group of people, and not just in this case. In all the other cases where this stuff comes out, those poor jurors are left sitting there going, what? They just fed me a load of crap. And I believed I was doing my duty as a citizen to decide on innocent or guilt beyond reasonable doubt. It's a lot of people damaged by this, a lot of people affected by it. And yet, who was it that said that, Stephanie? Wasn't fair in them. It's not. And and we do. We need to keep going. We need to keep going because we need to change this. Right. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I was a little bit nervous about doing this today, but you've been lovely and you've made it you made it a real pleasure once again. So um, I'm going to head off and I will be back soon. Uh, not quite sure when, but I, I will post when I'm coming back again. So sign the petition, watch the video, read the police report. I will put all the links in and yeah, let's come back and discuss all of that in a few weeks time. Okay, have a great rest of your Sunday and I will see you all very soon. Thanks a lot. Bye.